Hi, I'm Walden Bello. I'm a campaigner against the World Trade Organization. The last time we talked, it was shortly before the World Trade Organization's fifth ministerial in Cancun. We were able to win a reprieve for the world by derailing the Cancun ministerial. Another ministerial is going to be taking place right in this city in December of 2005. And now I'm here to tell you why this ministerial in Hong Kong is really bad for you. It's not really good. WTO kills farmers. The WTO is suffering a real crisis of legitimacy. The July framework is a great step backward. This is an even worse deal than what was being presented at Cancun. This was a non transparent process. Because we have come to believe that no deal is better than a bad deal. Now, in order to understand the WTO better, uh, you've got to understand the G's. Now, what are the G's? G stands for group, and there are a few important groups to keep in mind. So let's start with the G20. The G20 is a block of rather large developing countries. These countries um, have large agricultural sectors and mainly the G20 wants to make sure they protect their agricultural sectors, uh, prevent their peasants from being driven off the land, and they're also very concerned that the EU and the United States do not continue to dump cheap subsidized goods on their economies, thus driving their farmers out of business. Okay, next up is the group of 33 or G33. Now, these are not just large developing countries. They include many of the smaller countries and they're mainly concerned about protecting their small farmers. They want a list of products called special products that will not be opened up for trade liberalization so as to protect the producers of those products in their countries. And second, they would like to be able to raise tariffs against imported agricultural commodities when these are disrupting their production. The group of 90 is a rather varied group of developing countries, many of them from Africa, Latin America, and Asia, that do not want the authority of the WTO to be expanded to new areas beyond trade, like for instance to investment and to competition policy. The group of 90 made a very big difference because it was the walkout of some of their members that led to the collapse of the Cancun Ministerial. And these three interlocking groups, the group of 20, 33, and 90, could again make the difference in terms of the outcome of the Hong Kong Ministerial. FIPS, or the Five Interested Parties, is a small group of countries, including Australia, the United States, European Union, Brazil, and India, that made the key decisions on what would go into a new agreement on agriculture prior to the July Framework Agreement. And many developing countries, in fact, complained that uh, this was a non-transparent process. Just to show how controversial it was, in order to arrive at a breakthrough in the agreement on agriculture, the five interested parties, uh, in fact, had to go to a secluded place in the Swiss Alps, and this was facilitated by the WTO Secretariat. And of course, when developing countries heard about this, they were very, very upset. As you know, the WTO operate through what are called ministerial meetings. At the third ministerial meeting in Seattle, 1999, we were able to stop the free trade, the corporate agenda from being pushed through. There were vast masses of people in Seattle, 50,000 people in the streets. However, they got back in November of 2001. They were able to stop us in Doha. They were able to push through the corporate agenda in a place where there were very, very few civil society organizations present and they were able to intimidate the governments of the developing countries. About two years later, the six ministerial met in Cancun and uh, we were able to stop the expansion of the WTO agenda to areas like investment and competition policy. Well, it was a victory in Cancun because basically the ministerial failed to come to an agreement. This was, of course, directly due to the fact that developing countries were resisting, had formed groups to resist the interests of the United States and the EU. But I don't think it would have been possible if it weren't for the mobilizations both in, inside and outside of the convention center in Cancun. And of course, the self-immolation of Lee kyung hae sparks the demonstrations. Of course, there could be moral judgment as to the death itself but I think it's important that we keep in mind that his last words were that WTO kills farmers and I think it really helped to bring out the plight of farmers not just in Korea but all around the world and not just farmers but even workers and other people 
So why is the Hong Kong Ministerial of the WTO so important? Well, look at it this way. We've stopped them twice. This was in Seattle and in Cancun. They were able to get back on their feet in Doha. Here in Hong Kong, we're out to try to derail the WTO for the third time and hopefully this will permanently cripple that organization as a mechanism of trade liberalization and the expansion of the corporate agenda. Well, what exactly is the July framework. July framework is a neoliberalistic globalization policy and so July framework is a start to deregulate everything. Because the EU and the United States did not like the results of Cancun in which there was no agreement for more trade liberalization, they cheated their way through the General Council meeting in July by convening simply 40 of more than 100 country negotiators and moving forward the demands of the rich countries on the south. And this is the July framework. It contains all the points in agriculture, in industrial tariffs, in services, and other areas that were rejected in Cancun. And then, not even a year later, the same points and substances of the text pass as the framework for negotiations. The developing countries were really upset because a ministerial agenda was passed by a general council meeting, and this amounted to an institutional coup. And it happened during a summer where most government ministers and civil society organizations were not aware and did not make it to Geneva. But what we saw with the July framework is a new arena of decision making that is closed off from public scrutiny where no civil society was allowed to observe the proceedings or even have access to their country delegates. Then what the July framework have done is that they revived that process that drive so many people into the misery the last 10 years. So is this important for uh, civil society around the world to put more attention into Geneva? Local civil society, uh, trade unions, farmers groups, people in Switzerland or around in that region really to concentrate and to follow closely what happened in Geneva. To make sure that everybody has access to what's happening inside. We have access to our delegates, we have access to our trade ministers, we have access to all the negotiations and that these negotiations indeed are conducted under public scrutiny. We must fight for that, whether that takes protests on the streets, whether that takes blockading, whether that takes forcing our way into the WTO. I mean, there's a number of things that need to be done. This is an even worse deal than what was being presented at Cancun. The July framework, to be denounced, the July framework is a great step backward. Now, the main elements of the July framework had to do with agricultural liberalization, industrial tariff liberalization, services, and the treatment of developing countries. Let's take up agriculture. Basically, the July Framework Agreement on Agriculture essentially preserves the very high rates and modalities of subsidization of the agricultural commodities of developed countries while seeking greater market access to the markets of the developing countries. Uh, everybody said that they want to reduce uh, subsidies, especially subsidies that distort uh, market or export subsidies and really to create uh, securities for consumers and producers. The July framework hasn't shown that it helped building towards that goal. The developed countries, the US and the EU, promised uh, to cut export subsidies in uh, agricultural products, but no time frames ever bring up. I would say it is just empty talks. The big countries still can expand their subsidies. It seems like they will never stop subsidy and no commitment really on the issues of export subsidy. The subsidies will be enlarged under the blue box and will continue under the green box, which are certain provisions in the agreement on agriculture that allowed both the EU and the US to continue supporting primarily rich farmers. In fact, the kind of subsidies being talked of being removed are marginal and are going to be very long time in the future. And while the reduction of tariffs are going to be immediate, so we really face an immediate dislocation that would take place. What this would mean, of course, is that you would have a continuing of the dumping of the highly subsidized products of the EU and the United States on developing country economies, which means that our ag agriculture is going to become even worse. Uh, yung WTO, napakalaki ng epekto sa aming mga magsasaka dahil doon sa patuloy na pagdagsa ng mga produkto galing sa ibang bansa, katulad ng bigas at ng gulay, yun yung nagpapabagsak sa aming mga produkto. And the current regime in the WTO does not do anything to control dumping. And this will continue and will be sanctioned if the July framework is agreed. 
60 to 70 percent of the economic activities of the people are concentrated in agriculture. It's not really a question of trade, it's really a question of livelihood and survival. Kaya makikita natin talaga, dinurog nito hindi lamang ang agrikultura kundi manufacturing. Yon, ang napakatinding pinsal lang idinulot ng GAT WTO regime. With the issue of microorganism patenting, the patenting of biotechnological processes would threaten agriculture in a very big way. So we have the real threat of our agriculture passing into the hands of seed monopolies of the developed countries. The peasant in Indonesia are feeling that 10 years of WTO is just enough. That's why we mobilize the peasant all around the world against WTO. There is only one thing, WTO out of agriculture. And the July framework affected all of the peasants there in the fields. And we will say no to WTO. Stop not around for WTO. WTO is out for agriculture, out from services and out from everything. So again, the developmental concerns, which is leading to large-scale deindustrialization of the develop developing countries, does not seem to be the main focus of the agenda. Under the so-called NAMA, or Non-Agricultural Market Access, the July framework modalities essentially are demanding a bringing down of the tariffs for manufactured and industrial goods of all countries, but the impact will be mainly felt by developing countries which have kept up high tariffs in order to be able to protect their industries. Now what NAMA is going to mean is the deindustrialization of the developing countries which is why it's got them really worried. Services, what we see here is really a very great threat. Many of these areas of services we are familiar with. Health services, legal services, environmental services, education. What's going to happen under the July framework is that developing countries now have to make promises or offers of what services they open up to the service providers from the developed countries. Uh, for the Hong Kong people, the biggest concern is about uh, the negotiation on services in trade because the very little benefits we still have, like education, health services, water services, etc. There is a tendency for our government to spend less on them and uh, ask people to pay and then hand over them to the private sectors. So we have to fight against the WTO agreement because uh, we don't want the government have any excuse to exploit the people. Essentially, this is something very radical because this is being done under the principle of national treatment, which means that you will have to extend to foreign service providers the same rights, the same treatment as you give to your local service providers so that the basic concept of locals having preferential rights to exploit their economies is destroyed by this principle which is advanced by the July framework. Kasi ang layunin ngayon ng mauunlad na bansa ay further liberalization pa ang gusto nila. And what it does in the July framework is to put a time frame to really push or speed up liberalization of services. As uh, migrants advocates based in Hong Kong working with other groups in Asia, our biggest concern about WTO is it represents a lot of the poverty creating poverty and enhancing programs that has caused labor migration in the first place. So in Asia, there are about 31 million laboring migrants and a lot of these people moved out of their countries to work overseas because there are no work at their home countries. The agriculture and the rural sector has collapsed. Global uh, manufacturing has taken over the domestic economy. And all of these problems are represented by what WTO is trying to do. What the big powers are trying to do is to introduce new areas of privatization, new areas of uh, taking control over resources for big capital to make profits. I mean, if world's resources are to be utilized for private use of a few big companies and if the living resources of large numbers, millions of people are to be taken over and people are to be enslaved for profits of few companies, these are very destructive processes.
the treatment of developing countries. The July framework does not at all address the demand of the developing countries that their liberalization of their economies should be on a different path from that followed by the developed countries because they're at a different stage of development. The July framework practically ignores this whole issue. And finally, I think what we need to see running through this whole process is that each of these modalities or elements have now been adopted through a non-transparent, non-democratic process that was the result of an institutional coup. The General Council of the WTO had no business adopting this agenda, which could only have been adopted by a ministerial. And this is essentially the problem with the July framework. Are there alternatives to the World Trade Organization? You bet there are alternatives to the WTO. For 50 years, between 1945 and 1995, the world showed that it could do without a centralized trade organization like the WTO. We're not opposing trade. We're opposing the consolidation of monopolies, and the consolidation of oligopolies, and the consolidation of corporate interests in the hands of a few. Right now, there are many proposals, for instance, a world based on sovereignty, and a world based on really satisfying people's needs rather than corporate priorities. There are alternatives to a centralized Jurassic organization like the World Trade Organization. It's time to move towards those alternatives. So how do we derail the World Trade Organization? I think it's important to remember four letters. E-M-P-B. First of all, we have to educate people so that they realize that in fact they're living daily the bad consequences that the WTO imposes on people like them. Then, based on that education, we have to mobilize all over in order to be able to pressure their governments to derail the World Trade Organization. We are doing a lot of education and mobilization activities among uh, members and people in different sectors. Mula dun sa may mga pinakamalayong miyembro sa kanayunan ay binibigyan namin ng mga orientasyon ano ba ang WTO at ano ang epekto nito sa aming mga kasama. For the people who did not really know about the WTO, I think we should try to disseminate all this information so that they can uh, have activity and they can join uh, with us to doing some kinds of a rally. The globalization monitor is chiefly doing education work and we are really very angry upon uh, reading the details of the uh, July framework and it makes us believe that we must mobilize to the greatest efforts uh, to stop the WTO's agenda. Actually, we have organized uh, the Hong Kong People Alliance on WTO, which is composed of more than 30 organizations. We want to have a big ready to, to show the Hong Kong people power and also the power uh, from the other uh, countries' organizations all together to fight against WTO. And we also coordinate activities uh, which being proposed by various organizations, including those uh, internationally. We will do our best to provide the logistic support so that when they come, uh, they can get a facility to do the activities and uh, will be joined by the local people. There is a group in Hong Kong, there are alliances, there's a huge network, they're open, they're going to help us organize, so people must come there. Actually, we are, were able to organize a Southeast Asia Fishers Network for Justice. We're trying to organize a flotilla of ships representing different international NGOs and artisanal fishers from different regions. We're trying to mobilize at least 500 people that will uh, be aboard those ships and will uh, amass eventually in the Hong Kong Kong Harbor come December. There is going to be a very big number of the peasants uh, because the peasants feel that they have nothing else to lose now. And this is also for the workers as well, in the public sector workers, in the manufacturing sector, because they really want to see the end of the WTO. I think in Hong Kong, people will gather in larger numbers in order to derail the whole process that can only be done by people of all countries uniting. Kung malakas tayo, ganun din ang gagawin ng mga karatig mansa sa region. Kung malakas ang region, malakas din ang panahon sa buong mundo, itong hamon ng panahon sa nagbabagong mundo sa panahon ng GATWTO regime.
I think it's important to underline the importance of national campaigns. Through national campaigns, we remind our negotiators that they must not give in to the demands of the rich countries. Through national campaigns, we constantly remind them that a no deal is better than a bad deal. Even right now, we have been meeting our governments regularly to state our position to demand our government, you know, hold on, wait, please tell us what you are putting on the negotiation table. Sunod-sunod yung aming mga ginagawang kampanya para ipakita sa gobyerno na ang sektor ng magsasaka ay hindi pabor dun sa mga kasunduan sa ilalim ng WTO. Developing countries should act like developed countries. They have to really stick and consistent with their objectives. We'd like to see that the government really fight hard in the negotiation. Between now and Hong Kong, we don't have much time, but I think that those national processes will be really important, both in terms of getting civil society and social movements to work together at the national level, but also challenging parliaments and getting media involved to directly hold our governments to account. If they have a compromise at some points, then they're going to have a political backlash back home. There needs to be resistance at every level. It's important that the pressure is kept on in Geneva and, of course, the pressure in Hong Kong. And we feel quite confident that with the presence of the demonstrations and the actions inside and outside the convention center that we can really put pressure on the WTO and on the national governments to stop this process. The most important thing is to make sure that the national movements are not disenfranchised, that they have an important role to play in making sure that their governments are accountable to the people themselves about the positions they take in Geneva and at Hong Kong. Not all of you will be able to come to Hong Kong. However, you can play a very critical role during the international days of protest when there will be big mobilizations in your capital against the six ministerial of the WTO. The WTO or the existing multilateral negotiation system doesn't prove itself that it can deliver the promise of better life for people around the world. The WTO is suffering a real crisis of legitimacy. We've shown that we can do it. We know that the governments who are brokering the WTO are scared. We know the WTO secretariat is desperate. And so we need to keep the pressure on. We need to maintain the momentum. I think it is do or die. What we did in Cancun can be done in Hong Kong. The blow we can uh, deliver to the World Trade Organization in December will be decisive. I think the WTO should be scrapped. I don't think there is any place for reform. And the very fact that the WTO has failed two ministerials already, the very fact that it is having a difficult time come to, coming to an agreement, the very fact that it has to use its secretive meetings shows that the WTO oh, itself is in crisis. Maybe I'm being very optimistic, but I think just a little further push and the WTO WTO will collapse. We aim for the end or the termination of the WTO regime. I think we should put all the issues on the table and ensure that in Hong Kong no agreement is made. We must derail the WTO. What do we want to do about the WTO? What I believe most people and the momentum that is being built for derail the WTO. Because we have come to believe that no deal is better than a bad deal. Shut down the WTO. In order to have a successful mobilization in December to stop any deal to be made, I invite every one of you to join the local people and come here to Hong Kong to protest against the WTO. Kong Yi Sai Mao. I'm now outside the Hong Kong Convention Center. This is where the WTO ministerial will take place and this is going to be the site of the Battle of Hong Kong. What happens here in December 2005 will determine what kind of future we will have. Will it be a future dominated by corporations or will it be another future in which the needs of the people of the world will take priority? It is up to you. You will have to help us decide. Come and join us in derailing the six ministerial of the World Trade Organization in December 2005 here in Hong Kong. See you here.